Yeah. Okay, well, it looks like it's 2.10, so shall we begin? Yes, sir. <clears throat> okay, class, welcome back. So uh, this is my turn to lecture, and I'll take up the full time. We're discussing nuclear weapons proliferation and using the uh, Vipin Narang book. So let me give a few introductory remarks about it. Uh, uh, first of all, on proliferation, uh, in the early days, there was a debate about how do we know when a country has nuclear weapons, and the only agreed definition was if it detonated a nuclear device. Uh, that took care of most, but not quite all, nuclear weapon states. Uh, very briefly, as you know, of course, the U.S. detonated the two nuclear weapons against Japan in 1945. The Soviet Union detonated its first device in 1949. Then in the 50s, uh, it was just uh, Britain, uh, United Kingdom in 1952. In the 60s, it was uh, France in 1960. These are all fission weapons initially, although the US and the Soviet Union detonated thermonuclear weapons later. Uh, France detonated the nuclear device in 1960, the Chinese in 1964. It was in the 60s that the Israelis, we believe, developed nuclear weapons, but they never detonated one. Although there is one controversial incident we might get to later in the class. Uh, then after 1964 and the Chinese, these were the five nuclear weapon states, US, Soviet Union, Britain, France, and China. Then uh, after that, uh, with the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty entering into force in 1970, there was a hiatus of new nuclear weapon states. Although India did detonate a, what they call a peaceful nuclear explosion in 1974, PNE. This hiatus lasted until 1998 when India and Pakistan both detonated devices and declared themselves nuclear weapon states, they had never joined the NPT, so they were not in violation of it. So that got us to uh, five nuclear weapon states plus Israel uh, without detonating is six, India and Pakistan is eight. And then uh, there was again uh, a brief hiatus till North Korea detonated their first device in 2002, I think, right, Mensa? Uh, first, uh, 2006. 2006, okay. And, uh, and that was the, so that's six and two or eight and one or nine. And Iran has been moving in the direction of acquiring nuclear weapons, but has not yet gotten there and has not ever detonated. So at the moment, we have nine nuclear weapon states. Beyond the five permanent nuclear weapon states, the other four are considered parts of nuclear proliferation. And we're going to talk about how you think about proliferation using some conceptual frameworks and theoretical ideas developed by Vip and Narang. Vivian Aaron was a graduate student in political science at Stanford. He studied with Scott Sagan, a well-known uh, scholar in the field, and he's now a professor of political science at MIT. Uh, the work is a bit theoretical and abstract, but I'll try and get through the main points to you. Let's begin. Uh, so Narang's approach is not to examine how states acquired the weapons, or who tested when, but rather how existing middle power nuclear states use their nuclear posture to support their strategic interests. Okay, what is the value of nuclear weapons to these states, considering France, China, Israel, India and Pakistan, North Korea, and also one state that acquired them and then gave them up, South Africa? Next. Uh, Narang postulates three regional power nuclear postures, three ways in which they use nuclear weapons. The first he terms the catalytic posture. 
uh, in which nuclear weapons breakout is nuclear weapons breakout is threatened in the event of a state survival. And uh, it's threatened by conventional attack in order to compel a third party intervention on the state's behalf. The great example of this was the 73 Yom Kippur War between Israel and the main Arab states of Egypt, Syria, and Jordan, in which uh, Israel was initially on the defensive after a surprise attack by Egypt, which crossed the Suez Canal and, uh, and uh, reclaimed the Sinai, by Jordan, which regained parts of Jerusalem, and by Syria, which was regained parts of the Golan Heights in the north and threatened the population centers in Israel. At the time, uh, the defense minister of Israel, Moshe Dayan, requested of Israel's prime minister to authorize use of Israeli nuclear weapons to stop the invading Arab armies. Um, Golda Meir refused. She rejected his idea and instead contacted Henry Kissinger to see what he could do to uh, support Israel and to uh, block any Soviet intervention. So catalytic posture, threatening nuclear weapon breakout in the event a state survival is threatened by conventional attack in order to compel a third party intervention on the state's behalf. This was trying to get the US to intervene. The US did provide arms reinforcements to Israel, but did not physically intervene with any troops of its own. Look at this catalytic posture. Next. Assured retaliation posture. Uh, Professor. Yes. Uh, I have my own question. Yes. The previous slide. So do you think uh, uh, it's reasonable to think that uh, countries may develop their nuclear weapons to use them for a catalytic posture or this purpose? Um, well, I mean, I, yes, I think that it's possible, and Israel is the case in point, that if threatened with conventional attack, that they use nuclear weapons or the threat of nuclear weapon deployment or use to try to get a third party like the United States to intervene. I think this is the main example. I don't think there are many examples of this, but there's this one. Okay. Hi, uh, I, I, have a, I have a question too. Sorry, it's hard to interrupt, Professor. Yeah. As you go through these postures, could you, so I, I just want to, to, to uh, sort of uh, reiterate that these are declared postures by a nation state, right? No. No, actually, they're not. They're, they're Vipinacron's labels for okay. what these postures are. They, they were never declared. Thank you. It's his own thinking about what's involved here. All right. Uh, second, second question. As you go through them, will you give some other examples so, so the students can sort of uh, okay. map one to one between the postures and the. Right. I don't have any good examples of catalytic posture other than the Israeli right. Arab one. Thank you. Next. The short retaliation posture is development of secure second strike capabilities to threaten certain nuclear retaliation should it suffer primarily a nuclear attack. So, uh, you know, look, in some ways, this is the US Soviet uh, relationship. Uh, the US never thought of attacking uh, the Soviet Union first with nuclear weapons. We're not positive what the Soviets were trying to do, but they may well have been thinking about an initial nuclear strike. And the US had re assured retaliation, originally developed by McNamara, assured destruction to deter the initial strike. Later, 
uh, China and Indi China and India fought uh, a war in which uh, possibly uh, India was concerned that China would use nuclear weapons and India had nuclear weapons for assured retaliation. It didn't seem to come up by the way, there was a, a Chinese Russian Sino-Soviet border conflict in 1969 when both had nuclear weapons, but nuclear weapons did not seem to figure in that. This is a border uh, dispute over two main rivers, the Asuri and Amir rivers in, in the Siberian section of East, uh, Northeastern uh, China. Uh, but it doesn't appear that nuclear retaliation was part of the play there. Okay. But that's a second uh, nominal approach of use of nuclear weapons by a middle power, according to Narang. Next slide. Asymmetric escalation. This is developed capabilities and procedures that credibly enable rapid first use of nuclear weapons in the event of a conventional attack. So uh, possible example of this would be, uh, there was that one interesting case in 1990, no, in 2008, uh, Pakistani insurgents went into India and attacked the city of Mumbai and uh, killed a large number of uh, civilians and children. And uh, Pakistan was concerned that if India retaliated with a conventional attack of its own, that Pakistan would use nuclear weapons to retaliate against India. India, in fact, uh, restrained itself and did not retaliate against Pakistan. This was quite a surprise. Uh, a different possible example would involve the French if the French were somehow attacked by conventional forces from, <coughs> from Russia, and the French would use the threat of nuclear weapons to deter the Russian attack. <coughs> Pardon me. Okay, next minute. So Now, uh, um, Narang went through a lot of statistical testing of the hypotheses of the value of these three concepts. And he's asserted that a catalytic posture, that was the first one, would have little effect in deterring a low or high intensity conflict initiated by either nuclear or non-nuclear opponents. So uh, it's interesting, he, he doubts that the Israeli approach would have deterred uh, the Arab states from uh, an initial attack. Next. States with an assured retaliation posture should face a reduced frequency of high intensity attacks from both nuclear and non-nuclear opponents. The posture should face an increased frequency of low intensity conventional attacks initiated by nuclear opponents and an unchanged frequency of low intensity conventional attacks from non-nuclear opponents. So then he's trying to understand here the threat of nuclear retaliation under different circumstances, nuclear and non-nuclear opponents nuclear and non-nuclear attacks, low intensity conventional attacks. Okay, next. Finally, uh, which is his favorite uh, posture, Narang states with asymmetric escalation, 
uh, an asymmetric escalation nuclear posture would face fewer attacks from both nuclear and non-nuclear opponents across all measurable intensities of armed conflict. So we believe that the capability to inflict asymmetric destruction with nuclear weapons would be a successful deterrent against nuclear and non-nuclear states. Okay. So here are Narang's major findings from statistical analysis. This is all written up in the book sections that I've asked you to read. Asymmetric escalation posture is uniquely and significantly deterring conflict at every level of armed intensity. So you have here uh, in the level of escalation, no dispute, dispute with no force, one side uses force, reciprocal use of force and war. And the frequency count for each target nuclear posture from 1945 to 2001, it shows that asymmetric escalation uniquely deters conflict at every level. Okay, move on. I have a question, Professor. Now. Yes. Uh, so here, Biffin around uh, differentiate the middle power, middle nuclear powers to superpowers. Right. So, what well, what are characteristics, the and the differences between them? Well, the superpowers are considered, you know, U.S., Soviet Union, and he put Britain in that category, U.K. Mm -hmm. So they have, well, of course, the U.S. Soviet Union have much larger nuclear forces and much a, a, a great variety of targets that they could hit. The middle powers are more limited in their nuclear capabilities and the targets they could hit. Uh, for example, uh, uh, the French have for the most part had a counter value targeting strategy. They target the cities. Whereas of course, as you know, the US and the Soviet Union have counter force and counter value targeting capabilities. And the British too don't have the weapons to do a lot of sophisticated counter force targeting. It's mostly counter value targeting. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank Next. you. Next. Nuclear posture and crisis behavior. Three hypotheses. Hypothesis one, crises are likely to be initiated by the assured retaliation state. The state that has the ability to retaliate with incredible lethality is the state likely to initiate the crisis. Second hypothesis is crises are more likely to be initiated by the asymmetric escalator. And the third hypothesis, states adopt a posture that is security efficient no difference in deterrence power between the postures. These are three different hypotheses that Narang asserts are strategies of middle powers. Okay, next. There's the Mumbai case, nuclear strategy of middle powers. Now what happens here and what's of concern is that when the Pakistani insurgents killed the Indian civilians, uh, it was initially con of concern in the United States that India would respond with conventional attacks against the headquarters of the Pakistani insurgents in Pakistan. So India would cross the border into Pakistan use conventional forces to strike at the Pakistani insurgents who would kill their civilians. However, what was concerned, and, and which of course they did not do, 
They did not do that. India did not, did not respond. What has become of increasing concern in Washington is if India did that, then Pakistan, which has a history of fighting wars with India and losing on the conventional level, that Pakistan would actually use, Pakistan would use some of its own nuclear weapons on Pakistani territory to destroy the Indian retaliatory forces. And if they did that, then India would respond to the response with a massive nuclear strike on Pakistan. So again, it's four steps. It's Pakistani insurgents attack Indian civilians and kill them in a conventional attack. In, India responds with conventional counterattack against the Pakistani insurgents. The third round is Pakistan uses nuclear weapons in limited numbers to destroy the Indian counterattack forces. And the fourth is that India then responds with massive nuclear attack against Pakistan. The US position, of course, has always been opposed to any use of nuclear weapons by anybody in any capacity. And uh, they actually used uh, in the George W. Bush administration when this occurred, they sent uh, Rich Armitage, who was Deputy Secretary of State under Colin Powell to mediate and calm down the Indians and the, persuade them not to attack, which was successful. But this remains an ongoing concern of a future scenario that begins with conventional forces and can wind up with nuclear weapon use. Is the sequence of events clear? Okay. Yes, I think so. Okay, let's move on. Now there's the Yom Kippur War, that's the 73 war. What happened there was the Israelis, after winning a big war in 67 and seizing the Sinai from Egypt, seizing uh, Jerusalem from the Jordanians, seizing the Golan Heights from Syria, was very cocky and self-confident and did not believe that the Arab states would attack Israel with conventional forces. And they were surprised in 73 when there was this coordinated Egyptian, Syrian, Jordanian attack. The, uh, the Egyptians uh, breached Israeli forces in the Sinai and they crossed the Suez Canal the Jordanians were successful in part, initially in parts of Jerusalem, and the Syrians were successful in uh, moving to breach the Golan Heights. I think I mentioned to you in the past, there was this Israeli general, Yanush Bengal, whom I met at Harvard when he came as a visiting fellow after the war. And it turned out he was really one of the heroes for Israel during the war because he led a small armed force, Israeli force that held off a large Syrian force, which if he was not able to do it, would have been able to attack Tel Aviv and Haifa and the major population centers of Israel. But yet this was a case where Israel was able to limit the, limit the struggle with conventional forces. It never escalated to nuclear weapon use. There was, by the way, another dimension to this, I and mean, this might be on the next slide, but where the Soviets decided to arm the Egyptians with nuclear weapons, and they sent some nuclear weapons by ship to Egypt. And that's where Kissinger intervened. Uh, Nixon, by the way, was sort of having a mental breakdown at the time over, the, over Watergate, so he was not really functioning. But Kissinger, as the National Security Advisor and also Secretary of State, uh, 
he uh, announced a an elevation of the U.S. Uh, nuclear uh, uh, preparedness level to DEFCON 3, Defense, Defense Condition 3, which is a very high level of preparedness in which actually the submarines leave their uh, ports and go to their firing stations and the land-based missile silos open the silo cover doors and the bombers start moving toward their points where they would attack Soviet targets. Uh, Kissinger announced this very publicly and this was an effort to deter the Soviet Union from arming the Egyptians with nuclear weapons and it succeeded. The, the Soviets stopped the rearmament. So you see in the real world with a number of different kinds of powers involved, it gets quite complicated. Okay, next. There's a crisis summary that Naran put together. Uh, you see each one of these, we can go through them sort of quickly. When uh, India contemplated a preventive strike against Pakistan, but chose not to do so. When India was supporting the Sikh insurgency uh, and possibly considered assured retaliation against India, but did not do so. When India con threatened conventional action against Pakistan, but did not do so. When Pakistan intensified the Kashmir insurgency, there have been a number of Kashmir conflicts Kashmir is a territory that is disputed between India and Pakistan. It's controlled by India nominally, but it has a Islamic population majority. Um, India constrained its response against Pakistan in that uh, Mumbai incident. Uh, India feared nuclear escalation if it retaliates. It's constant jockeying around for position is uh, down below. India feared nuclear escalation if it retaliated. And then the bottom ones by Israel, but no, uh, nobody was deterred because Israel never used nuclear weapons. Egypt and Syria considered attacking Demona, that's the main Israeli uh, nuclear reactor that was originally built for the Israelis by the French in the 60s. In the Yom Kippur War, Egypt and Syria invaded Israel, but Israel did not retaliate with nuclear weapons. And then during the Gulf War, there were scud attacks at population centers and at Demona. Uh, but Israel did not retaliate. So it turns out that, uh, you know, despite all these complexities, both in the Israeli Arab wars and the India Pakistan wars, of which there have been several no country ever decided to use nuclear weapons. So it shows that unlike maybe defense analysts, real political leaders are very cautious before authorizing the use of nuclear weapons for fear that it would lead to retaliation against them or against their population centers with massive casualties. I mean, if, if we had met here in the late 40s and I had said, you know what will happen over the next 60 years, there'll be eight or nine nuclear weapon states 
There'll be thousands of nuclear weapons deployed. There'll be a number of armed conflicts between the US and, uh, well, there'll be crises between the US and the Soviet Union. There'll be an armed conflict between the US and China and Korea. There'll be several armed conflicts in the Middle East involving Israel with nuclear weapons against the non-nuclear weapon states, Egypt, Syria, and uh, Jordan. And there'll be conflicts between the India and Pakistani states in which at one point both sides had nuclear weapons. And yet, despite all of those complexities, not a single nuclear weapon would be used by any state in any of these crises or wars over the entire 60 year period. If I were to assert that to you in the 1940s, you would have said I'm crazy or uninformed. Now you might say that anyway, but uh, that's in fact what happened. So, uh, and this also might, might have or might not have, and Sick will talk about this later in the course, relevance to North Korea too. Okay, next uh, slide. Here's a kind of complex flow chart, also from Narang's book. We can walk through it quickly here. A regional nuclear power has the availability of a reliable third party patron. So that was Israel had the US as a third party patron. And if it's yes, it could lead to a catalytic war. Uh, if it's no, it faces a conventionally superior offensive threat. If it faced a conventionally superior offensive threat, it could face asymmetric escalation or civil military arrangements. Again, Pakistan is an example of that. With civil military arrangements, it could uh, lead to assured retaliation or resource constraints. And these resource constraints could lead to assured retaliation or asymmetric escalation. And remember again that it is, and you might want to come to your own conclusion about this. It was Narang who believes that asymmetric escalation, the ability to escalate at a higher level than the adversary is the most featured uh, strategy to have if you're a nuclear middle power. Okay, next. Uh, application to North Korea. Pyongyang needs a third party patron and has it seemingly sort of in China. If China withdraws its support of North Korea, Pyongyang, according to Narang, would likely adopt a nuclear first use posture. Mansuk, do you want to comment on this? Right. Uh, so actually, Nering didn't uh, explain how can he apply his theory to North Korea. So he uh, fleshed out in a more elaborate explanation in a Washington Quarterly paper, which is published in 2015. So students and uh, uh, Laboratory scientists can check the, the you know, paper as well. So basically, uh, Pyongyang uh, began to actively develop its nuclear weapons from about uh, 1979, more or less. And uh, there was a first nuclear crisis in 1993 and 994. And during this time, uh, Pyongyang's uh, motivation seemed like uh, it needs a third party patron, so for instance, uh, security and economic uh, you know, uh, assurance and uh, you know, 
uh, is sick, is sought a uh, US uh, uh, economic uh, subsidies. So that was uh, the uh, motivation and the uh, North Korea's actual nuclear posture or strategy during that time. But as North Korea's nuclear capability uh, has grown and North Korea switched its uh, nuclear strategy to more likely uh, asymmetric escalation or uh, now uh, it seems like a North Korea has a asymmetric uh, escalation nuclear posture. But in the future, if North Korea could have uh, second strike nuclear forces, probably North Korea would again switch its uh, nuclear posture to assure destruction against the United States. And such a situation would give more advantages to North Korea vis-a-vis -vis its uh, military rival, South Korea. Is that clear, sir? Uh-huh, good. Any questions from the students about what Mansuk just said? I mean, think this is a very, uh, very current issue now because North Korea has fabricated a number of nuclear weapons. Some claim maybe 20 nuclear weapons. They have been building intermediate range and some intercontinental range missiles, which means that they could attack targets in South Korea and Japan and possibly some in the United States. The Trump initiative toward Kim Jong-un did not lead to any agreement. It was a great uh, sort of television spectacle. Trump was the first American president ever to set foot in North Korea. Um, but it didn't lead to any formal change in North Korea's nuclear program. Most American analysts believe that Kim Jong-un feels he needs nuclear weapons to maintain regime survival, not just externally against a threat, but even internally to keep the support of his own military. Professor Nock, we have, we have some really great questions in the chat. First off, can you define what a third party patron is? So a third party patron is a country that's allied to an, a nuclear power and is there and is pledged to protect that nuclear power from, from attack. I mean, the Thank U.S., you. there's, a, there's a, a kind of a, a complicated arrangement between the U.S. and Israel because there's no security treaty between the U.S. and Israel. But the U.S. has acted like a patron of Israel by supplying weapons Sharing, intel sharing intelligence, and in general, being closely allied with the state. Uh, in, the, in the 73 war, it was uh, Meir who rejected Diane's request for nuclear weapon deployment and instead contacted Kissinger, the US, its nuclear patron. And the same thing now, uh, a little different arrangement, North Korea has been isolated because of its nuclear program through economic sanctions in the whole world. And it only has China as its main support for fuel and food and also its earlier weapons programs. So China appears to be the third party patron of North Korea. Thank you. Uh, Daniel, would you like to ask your question? You had a really good one. Uh, sure, yes. Yeah. So I was actually wondering if North Korea would even be able to get second strike capabilities. Well, I mean, China, uh, North Korea, uh, based upon public information, has weapons, but they're deeply buried. They're hidden. They're in... Uh, in caves or underground silos, they're not easily identifiable. Now, you know, I don't know personally what the US targeting capability is against these weapons and what their confidence level is, but it's, I think it's plausible 
that the US, even if it struck North Korea first with nuclear weapons, it would not destroy all of North Korea's nuclear capability. Also, I think it's unlikely, frankly, that the US would attack North Korea first with nuclear weapons. The US doesn't have a no first use policy, but its policy has been in reality pretty much inclined not to use nuclear weapons unless the homeland of the US has been struck. Jake, can you ask your questions as well? You had some really good ones. Yeah, so uh, my question, Professor Nacht, is um, could countries adopt different postures against different adversaries? Like to, to use North Korea as an example, could North Korea adopt um, a different posture against the United States versus a different posture against um, South Korea? Of course, there's no, uh, you know, North Korea is a sovereign state. It can adopt whatever policies it wants toward any other country. Now, one, one other complication in the Korean case is there is a formal security pact between South Korea and the United States in which the United States has declared its intent to protect South Korea against any attack by a third party. So North Korea has to realize, and I'm sure they do realize that any attack by North Korea against South Korea would trigger some kind of American retaliation. Doesn't necessarily mean a nuclear attack, but uh, some kind of substantial conventional attack. And also on top of that, another major difference between like the Israeli case and the Korean cases, the Americans have stationed forces, they we've deployed U.S. forces in nuclear in South Korea since the end of the Korean War. The Korean War ended in 1953. That's uh, 47 and 21. That's 68 years ago. So the and, uh, another another question, uh, Professor Nacht. Um, you know, a, a lot of um, like all of uh, what Vipin Narang is saying seems to be like what countries will do reactively to towards aggression. You know, like ha has there been any work, or does does Vipin Narang consider any any possibility of a country, you know, potentially using nuclear weapons proactively rather than reactively? Right. Sure. So that's. Uh, I mean, I think the. The main judgment is that any first use of nuclear weapons against any state would almost certainly trigger a nuclear retaliation if the initial attack was against a nuclear middle power. So, it, you know, if the Soviet Union, if the Russia used nuclear weapons against France, France almost certainly would use nuclear weapons against. Uh, so against Russia. Uh, professor? Yes? Uh, it seems that North Korea's, um, I guess, nuclear posture is very dependent on their capabilities. As they uh, continue to develop more, and I guess that's better, um, more nuclear capabilities, can we expect a, uh, a war fighting landscape to be in flux? And things will be, I guess, changing in a quicker pace than we release nuclear posture reviews. Let's say we, you know, Biden throws out an NPR for 2021, and then all of a sudden, you know, we see North Korea has a new capability. Do we have to rewrite the North Korea section in our NPR and reissue a new one? Well, the NPR is a policy statement about what, what U.S. is would do under various conditions and why it justifies the forces that it has. But totally separately from that, the US intelligence community is constantly monitoring North Korean actions 24 seven. So uh, if, if the US identified some new North Korean capability that was extremely threatening, 
the U.S. would respond irrespective of what it said in the Nuclear Posture Review. Hey, Mansuk, uh, you wrote a really, really good article that I remember having some nice sort of um, conceptual sort of graphics for, for this type of thinking. Would you mind posting that either in the B courses or in the chat? Sure, that's my pleasure, although <laughs> that paper is not a good one. I, I think it was great. Also, I think it helps to have visuals for uh, sort of the, the decision charts. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think though what this review is telling you is that there are a couple of thorny problems ahead, just moving ahead here now, looking into the future with uh, nuclear weapons of the middle powers, particularly North Korea and possibly Iran if it crosses into the nuclear, uh, crosses the nuclear threshold. The US, the US is not interested in using nuclear weapons at all. We're interested in using nuclear weapons to deter nuclear weapon use. But that may not be the case for Pyongyang. It may not be the case for Tehran. It appears as though the US and Russia has a pretty stable nuclear deterrent relationship. It appears also, at least given the gro gross asymmetry in capabilities, the US has a stable nuclear deterrent relationship with China. The US has no uh, adversaries of any kind, adversary relationship of any kind with France or Britain. So uh, that's the Soviet, R Russia, China, France, Britain. The US has no uh, adversary relationship with Israel. Uh, and with India and Pakistan, the US is kind of neutral, although it has developed quite close ties in recent years with India. Uh, George W. Bush initiated a major uh, new policy with India in 2006, providing India with civilian nuclear capabilities, civilian nuclear energy capabilities. This was originally criticized because India is not a member of the NPT and it's a nuclear weapon state. Uh, the US has also tried to maintain decent relationships with Pakistan. It's used Pakistan as a leverage point into Afghanistan. But there's no particular adversary relationship of any kind between the US and Pakistan or the US and India. So at the moment, I'd say the main American concerns about possible conflict leading to nuclear weapon use are with North Korea and down the road with the Iran. Other questions, Aaron, from other students? Yes. Sorry. I think Spiro had another uh, a really good one. Um, what do you think will be the next country after Iran to potentially develop weapons and how will that affect the policy of like the posture of the main states? Good question. Great question. Well, it's hard to know, but there are some uh, statements by government officials. When I was leaving the Pentagon in 2010, I gave a talk at a, uh, at the uh, uh, a Washington Club, the Cosmos Club, and talked about US nuclear policy. And afterwards, the uh, military attache from the Saudi embassy came up to me. And he said, I just want you to know, and we've made it clear at the highest levels of your government, that if Iran was to acquire nuclear weapons, Saudi Arabia would definitely acquire them with 100% certainty. Remember the Middle East is a lot about the Saudi Iranian 
geostrategic competition. The Saudis don't have the capability to build them, but they certainly have the capability to buy them. So this would be a likely answer to your question. In addition, Turkey, which is uh, had been a secular state, but under Erdogan is becoming more Islamic in its policies, although it's still a NATO member. Analysts are increasingly of the view that Turkey would acquire nuclear weapons if Iran acquired nuclear weapons. Turkey and Iran, Sunni, Shia, uh, is Islamic, a Persian. Um, they would be a second state high on the list to acquire nuclear weapons. And third, possibly, would be Egypt. Egypt is a Sunni Arab state that historically has not been cordial with Iran, a Shia Persian state. So I would say that those three states um, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Egypt would be the candidates to acquire nuclear, but you never know. I mean, you never know. After all, in the past, South Korea and Taiwan both had incipient nuclear weapons programs. And even Japan had some ideas about a nuclear weapons program. And it's possible that proliferation in one part of the world could trigger proliferation in another part of the world, even though they're not directly opponents of each other. I think Dr. Shock asked, what about, what about uh, Syria? Syria at the moment is a wreck. It's been so destroyed by the civil war, it doesn't have any kind of capability of its own to build and deploy nuclear weapons. It does have now under Assad, a key ally in Russia. And of course, Putin could provide nuclear weapons, but that would be in violation of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Remember the key element of the NPT is that none of the five declared nuclear weapon states, US, Russia, United Kingdom, France, or China, would provide any nuclear weapons to any non-nuclear weapon state. That's a core pledge of the NPT. That doesn't mean countries don't break their pledges, but they do it uh, rarely, especially in a, in a high, high profile treaty like that. Remember there were previous periods where Argentina and Brazil had interest in nuclear weapons. And there's a South African case where South Africa actually fabricated a few weapons, but then gave them up because they didn't want to see the Mandela regime, the black African regime that would replace the white apartheid regime. They didn't want to see the Mandela regime have nuclear weapons. And then there's still another uh, uh, scenario which we didn't think of and yet it happened which is when the soviet union collapsed in 1991 it turned out a number of the soviet nuclear weapons were not in the russian republic they were in ukraine they were in belarus and they were in kazakhstan and each of those countries had to be dealt with through intense diplomatic relations before they gave up their weapons, they returned all their weapons to Russia, which is okay with the United States. So there's a totally different scenario, which we had, none of the analysts had thought of. And yet that became another problem for nuclear proliferation in the early nineties. Perhaps not. Yes. Uh, I have a comment. Yes. So uh, in order to expect who's going to be the next uh, nuclear proliferator, I think we should consider 
the cost of nuclear development. For instance, in South Korea, uh, getting you know fissile materials and uh, developing del delivery vehicles, for instance, missiles, might cost. For instance, uh, suppose that a uh, ten billion dollars. That's the front cost. And if South Korea goes nuclear, then it should expect international sanctions, not only from the United States, but also from the international community. And South Korea with an open economy, probably the sanction cost might exceed about thousand billion dollars, for instance. Then uh, you know, the cost of nuclear development is a thousand and ten billion dollars. And some isolated countries close the economy close the economy, probably uh, might expect less uh, expensive nuclear, cost of nuclear development. In Saudi, uh, the, a lot of, you know, uh, its GDP comes from uh, oil export. So yeah. it also needs to expect a lot of high cost of nuclear development. So uh, many people these days expect that South Korea would be the next nuclear proliferator, but I, I'm, Pretty much uh, skeptical about such an opinion. Right. Because and, uh, economic sanctions. Right. So I think uh, the cost of nuclear development might vary according to countries' uh, individual situation. Yes, I agree completely. I think it's a very good point. Absolutely. It's, it's hard to anticipate. That's why the US tries to keep a very aggressive intelligence and verification activity going. Uh, it also is involved with the IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, on uh, verifying that countries are in compliance with the NPT. And we have all these intense diplomatic relations with every one of these countries to try and uh, dissuade new nuclear weapons acquisition. One of the critiques of the Trump policies, the US America first policy was that he was so critical of the NATO allies that he thought that the NATO allies themselves would lose confidence in the American security guarantees. And this could lead to weapons proliferation among European states, Germany, uh, Italy, uh, possibly Turkey. There, there are NATO nuclear weapons on Turkish territory. So when you look at the nuclear strategy of the middle powers, it's a complicated game. And it's an uncertain game. The comforting thing is, all things considered, there have only been nine states that have acquired nuclear weapons since Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's far fewer than was anticipated. Sorry, one more question for you, Professor. Can you can you uh, explain what middle powers is? Jake and I have been Jake. Jake's answer to middle powers is that so it's you it, it, you know it when you see it. I, no, middle, I, middle power is in this case a middle power is a country with a, a relatively small nuclear arsenal. And it's primarily uh, aimed at a single adversary. And uh, so France, Britain, um, are middle powers. Israel's not even a middle power. Israel's less than that. Um, And India and Pakistan have nuclear weapons, but the arsenals are relatively small. The United States also has led the world in the development of the triad, the launch vehicles for nuclear weapons, right? Uh, ICBMs, SLBMs, and strategic bombers. The Russians followed suit, the Soviet Union followed suit. The Chinese are first now developing submarine launch ballistic missiles after all these decades. But most of the other states do not have a triad of delivery vehicles, the French, 
the British, uh, they have uh, one or two legs, but not all three legs. And of course, if you want to be fully comprehensive, the US has a fourth leg because we have cruise missiles that carry nuclear weapons, which relates actually to your student project about having low yield nuclear sea launch cruise missiles. Professor, doesn't it mean that it's just a part of the sea based leg of the triad? It is, although in theory, the cruise missile could also be deployed in the air and on the ground. There are air launch cruise missiles. Like an Alcom or LRSO, you mean? Sorry? Like an Alcom or LRSO? Yeah, Al Al yeah right. Any other questions? Yeah, I had a I had a quick question. Um, how do you see uh, upcoming demographic trends impacting potential nuclear weapons policy and proliferation? Uh, like more specifically, is a lot of developed countries around the world continue to see falling birth rates, birth rates, and uh, you know, consequentially, there are a pool of young people in the like eighteen to twenty five year range for maintaining a conventional military dwindles. How might that impact nuclear weapons policy and proliferation? I don't think personally there's any connection to speak of between birth rates and uh, proliferation. Proliferation is a high level decision taken by the leadership of the country, be primarily because of uh, extreme threat or because they're trying to do it for uh, prestige. India and Pak India India uh, was motivated in part by prestige to acquire domestic prestige and international prestige to acquire its own nuclear weapons. Um, and if you look at the different countries, I mean, India has a population of uh, what, 1.2 billion or something. Uh, two of the largest countries in the most populous countries in the world have nuclear weapons, but other countries, uh, Indonesia, which has two or 300 million people, no nuclear weapons. So it's normally related to security and prestige, not related to other uh, motivations of national policy. Now, maybe it'll change. So you never say never in this business. Uh, that's been the pattern so far. And also recall that uh, it's not so easy to build these things and to acquire them. It costs a lot of money to buy them. It costs uh, a tremendous amount to have the infrastructure to develop them. And, uh, and the vast majority of countries in the world, almost every one of the countries, including the countries I mentioned, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Egypt, have all signed the NPT saying that they will, they forswear getting them. Now they could violate the treaties, but most countries don't violate most treaties. Most treaties are adhered to by most countries. About Thank how much you. does a weapon cost, Professor? Uh, let me just say another. Uh, Another uh, motivation, this incentive to acquire weapons is that once you acquire them, you are now on the target list of other nuclear weapon states, particularly adversarial nuclear weapon states. And nuclear weapons can cost uh, tens of millions of dollars. The bigger cost is actually in the launch vehicle rather than in the weapon. So how much are those? They're, you know, could be, you know, US, US uh, launch vehicles are in the billions of dollars. I don't, think, I don't think you can 
I don't think that's like a simple, you know, it's not like something you can buy at the store on its own cost. I think right. cost scales by a series of factors. I think you know that. Okay, next uh, slide. Are we done? Or? This is the last slide. Okay, last slide. So here, beyond Iran, what are the implications for the Iranian nuclear posture? The effect on Israel given Iran's declaratory policy to wipe Israel off the map. It, Israel, uh, Iran's official policy is that Israel is not a legitimate state and uh, should be destroyed. And at different times, the Ayatollah, of course, Ayatollah Khomeini and Ayatollah Khamenei have stipulated that Israel will disappear from the map within 25 years. Now, it's one thing to say that, it's another thing to start investing heavily in a nuclear weapons program, which Iran has done. That combination makes the Iranian threat very credible to the Israelis. So Israel has done a lot of things to try and retard the Iranian program. They collaborated with the US on uh, cyber attacks to forestall Iranian nuclear weapons development. Uh, they have assassinated a large number of scientists and engineers who work on the program. <coughs> but there's never been a war, a direct war between Israel and Iran. The effect of Iran's nuclear posture on the US, the US of course has growing concerns about Iran. We have the JCPOA, which we'll talk about more Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. This is the agreement that Obama signed in 2015 and Trump uh, removed the US from 2019. Now Biden wants to resume the negotiations about rejoining the JCPOA. <coughs> Effective Iran's nuclear posture on future nuclear proliferators, on the Saudis, on Turkey, on Egypt, <coughs> with Pakistan serving as an Islamic provider. Now, note Pakistan is the only Muslim country that has nuclear weapons. And it gives them a certain prestige in the Muslim world. So would Pakistan want to see other Muslim countries have nuclear weapons? The Saudis are a Muslim state. Turkey is becoming a Muslim state. Egypt is a Muslim state. It's not clear that Pakistan sees in its own interests to provide nuclear weapons to these other Islamic states. <coughs> but if you think about it, these are three ways to think about the impact of the Iranian nuclear posture. One is the effect on Israel, possibly leading to confrontation, conventional war, or even nuclear war with Israel. Confrontation with the United States, leading to conventional or possible nuclear war and confrontation with others in the region that triggers further proliferation. Finally, the DPRK's nuclear arsenal with its effect on the US, South Korea, nuclear and conventional forces. And I would say even on Taiwan because uh, Taiwan status as you probably know remains highly uncertain. China considers it the wayward province from the 1949 revolution. Uh, it's possible if the, North, if the Korean Peninsula became more nuclearized, this might trigger Taiwan getting into the nuclear game as well. So there are a lot of iffy, dangerous, questionable issues embedded in every one of these four bullets. And this is, uh, when you think of the, no. 
when you think of the Biden agenda, these are near the top of the list. The uh, how to get how to deal with Iran and maybe get the JCPOA back on track. Possibly what to do with North Korea. And how to keep the Saudis, Turks, and Egypt from becoming new nuclear weapon states. Another feature previously was that Trump just recently, you know, uh, had very close ties with the Saudis. Trump's very first foreign trip after he was inaugurated was to Saudi Arabia. Now it's thought that this is, has nothing to do with global politics, it has to do with business. That Trump had ties with the Saudi government, that Jared Kushner had ties with the Saudi government, and that uh, what Trump was doing was buttering up to the Saudis for uh, personal gain. And then there was this terrible tragedy when the Saudis killed Khashoggi, the prominent Saudi journalist, who was a resident of the United States, who was a columnist for the Washington Post. He was invited into a uh, Saudi consulate in Turkey and he was killed. He was never seen alive again. He was chopped up into a lot of different pieces. And Trump never denounced it. He never said anything to criticize the Saudi regime. This is totally different under Biden now. Uh, Biden is rolling back systematically most of Trump's policies, just as Trump had rolled back most of Obama's policies. So uh, I'd say the likelihood of increased tensions in Saudi US relations remains high. And in fact, Biden's already taken a major step the Saudis have uh, forces in Yemen uh, in conflict with the Houthis. The Houthis are a Shia sect in Yemen. And because the Saudis are Sunni and are fighting the Houthis. And Trump gave a lot of military support to the Saudis to fight the Houthis. And Biden has just terminated that support. Another thing that I didn't mention is NATO has nuclear weapons that are largely, they're in different countries, but they tend to be under American control. They're in Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, and Turkey are bases with NATO weapons on them, but they're under US control. Those are separate from the French and British independent nuclear forces. Make sure you understand that distinction. I have a question, Professor Nath. Yes. Uh, Red Roberts uh, wrote an article in uh, 30 and North about the uh, prospect of a NATO-like nuclear sharing program in Northeast Asia. And so also, just take your finger away from your mouth so I can see you better. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, so say, repeat. Yeah, uh, Dr. Brad Roberts wrote an article yeah. in uh, 30 and North about uh, the NATO-like nuclear sharing program in Northeast Asia. And also Chuck Hagel and other fellows uh, wrote a report uh, published by uh, Chicago Council of International Affairs and also published on uh, Foreign Affairs. So they also urged the need of a nu nuclear sharing program in Northeast Asia. And uh, how do you think the prospect of you know, NATO-like approach in Northeast Asia, would, you, would it be possible? Well, I'm not quite sure what they mean by nuclear sharing. I mean, the US has had nuclear weapons deployed on South Korean territory and we've removed them. Now there are actually some parliamentarians in South Korea who want those weapons returned. 
But I think I think Biden will be cautious before reintroducing nuclear weapons onto South Korean territory. He also does not want to see Japan develop interest in nuclear weapons. Um, we had carriers with nuclear weapons in Japanese waters, but they have been removed. So I think uh, the US approach uh, in Northeast Asia is rather different from Europe and NATO. What the US is doing is they're trying to emphasize more missile defenses and means to protect South Korean territory from uh, North Korea. And we're also trying, Biden will now stop the criticism of South Korea, which Trump initiated for not spending enough money on uh, US forces in uh, South Korea. Biden will terminate that policy as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So this is a brief tour of the nuclear strategy of the middle powers. It's complicated. It's uncertain. And it requires further study. Uh, I think next time Professor Van Bibber returns to the lecture. Is that correct, Mitza? That's correct, sir. Yeah. Okay, any last questions or comments from the students? Uh, I have a I brief have question. Oh, okay. I'll go ahead. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I was curious, does Vipin discuss the impact of cyber capabilities and strategies on nuclear deterrence? Not really, no, he doesn't get into that much. And that's a, that's a growing issue of great importance. As I mentioned, there was US-Israeli collaboration of cyber attacks against the gas centrifuges of the Iranians. There's concern, a lot of concern about cyber attacks against the command and control systems of nuclear weapons. So this is a growth stock for study. Okay, thank you. Um, I will probably be asking for reading that specifically addresses that later if someone has suggestions. Sure, sure. Okay, good. Um, I, I was wondering uh, if there's any uh, one, one reason in the world that I'm curious a bit about on the, the nuclear policy and proliferation side might be um, the regions in the Russian Federation that are ethnically non-Russian, like Tatarstan, Chechnya, Dagestan, the right. many others. Um, if relationships between uh, the non-ethnic Russians and, and, the, and, and the ethnic Russian government gets tested, could there be any sort of nuclear proliferation in that part of the world or, or, or anything? Well, I think the Russians would do everything it possibly could to prevent that. Right. I mean, they fought a bloody war with Chechnya to prevent Chechnyan uh, independence or Chechnyan uh, autonomy and Dagestan and these other areas also. So, you know, I, I think Putin would not hesitate to squelch anything that looked like an independence movement or certainly a nuclear weapons uh, effort by any of those uh, republics. That makes sense, thank you. Uh, okay, quick comment, we, for those of you who haven't filled out the form, please fill out the form. Okay. I know you guys love forms, just fill out the form. Okay. okay, wonderful. Good to see you all. We'll see you again on Wednesday. Great. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.